Steve McDonald, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Alan. Thanks. Good to see you. So, what what kind of backdrop do I see you there? That's not a backdrop. I've, I that's not a place I've been before, and I've, I've uh, I don't think that looks like Florida. No, it's not Florida. Uh, I'm out here in Aspen, so trying to get a little R and R, enjoying the, the trees, the weather, getting away from the heat and humidity for a little little bit. Right. Absolutely. So uh, everybody should be able to do that living in Florida. The humidity, uh, you know, here is tough. But you and I know each other from the Tampa Bay area. Um, and I know you, you you get out and travel a little bit. And so I happen to catch you out uh, traveling slash holiday. And I appreciate you like holding this appointment. I, I, I figured you would be back in Tampa. But next thing I know, you you dial in and you're dialing in from out there. And that, that's that's pretty cool. And it's uh, frankly making me quite jealous. <laughs> well, thankfully, we have this technology, right? This, this makes it all happen. Yeah. Isn't that right? Um, yeah. So you've probably got nice, perfect weather, low humidity. Is it how 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 well is it going out there? Uh, it's pretty nice. You're just uh, you know fighting off a couple black bears here and there, but you know it's all good. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Steve, thanks for being on my little show here. Um, as you know, I just launched this podcast uh, uh, just a few months ago, and my goal is just to interview as many you know entrepreneurs as possible uh, at different levels of success, right? Because really, what I'm trying to do is is set some inspiration out there, um, some guidance out there for aspiring entrepreneurs, early stage struggling entrepreneurs, ones that haven't taken the leap, ones that have, to hear different stories of all walks of life, different stages, some, um, you know, but everybody at, when, that I interview at some point has had some level that they can look back and talk about um, their story and, and how they got there and what kind of lessons they learned, you know, along the way. And that's my mission for this podcast is to is to pull that out of people and, and just share it out, right? Um, so thank you for, for coming on. Yes, absolutely. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so, okay, so again, we've known each other for a good number of years and uh, we've you know looked at a lot of deals together and you've invested in a good number of companies that, that I'm, I'm very close to and know of. And I even, even brought you a couple that you, uh, that, that were, that you liked. Um, so this is a, quite an honor to have you. Um, I've got a little opening uh, slide that uh, that I like to throw out there just to get the party started, just to put the shock factor on my guest, and um, and just to get your uh, just to get your immediate opening uh, con uh, uh, kind of reaction to something, right? So you know, as I was preparing for you, and we did a, we've known each other for a while, and I've, of course I read as much more if I could find to get a feel for for the philosophy according to according to Steve McDonald. Um, this idea of a maverick came up, right? And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and so, I, by the way, I wanted a word that had a good, uh, that had a good ring, alliterative ring with maverick. So I came up with this maven. So I looked at maven. Maven is kind of an, you know, an expert or enthusiast, right? So maverick or maven, or maven uh, which makes the best entrepreneur? It's a question to you. Oh, um, well, <laughs> do you really think that you need to ask? you know, ask that question. It's definitely going to be the Maverick, right? Okay. You know, we've got, you know, knowledge is power, but not without action. And so, yeah. you know, there's lots of mavens who know a lot about a lot of different things or they're experts in these ones real small field, but you know, I'll take the Maverick over a Maven 99 times out of maybe 99.5 times out of a hundred. Okay. And, and like expand on that. I mean, is it is it is it mostly? Well, it has a lot to do with because that was your path, right? Um, what are some other betting reasons that you know, as an investor, for say, for example, that you know, you go with the Maverick? What are some other things that come to mind? I think that you know, when people <clears throat> when people dedicate their life to a specific expertise um, and they get very narrowly focused on on a particular specialty or domain expertise um, <clears throat> I think they do that at the exclusion of learning about lots of other things and really in the world of, of entrepreneurship you you know to be a really successful entrepreneur you got to be great at a lot of little things and right. like, I don't need to be, you know, I have an accounting background, but you would never want me to do your taxes. <laughs> That's like the worst thing you, for anybody. But 
the the you know but if i had like worked and developed my special expertise in accounting then i would have done that at the sacrifice of cultivating my leadership skills cultivating cultivating my sales skills my marketing skills public relations um and just all of those fundamentals that go into act that's re, that's necessary for building a successful business just being a specialist in one in a, in a domain you're going to do that at the exclusion of of really building a great company and that's my opinion and and i would i want to ask you something i would add to that you know something about the maverick you know the entrepreneur and the maverick do often go together and, and when you say there's this other kind of psychological intangible out there of uh, you know wanting to charge your own path, uh, you know forge your own path and do things your way, and that sounds a little egotistical. And there's certain you can definitely get too far e egotistical with that for sure. But but there is something fundamental about entrepreneurship where someone ha has a, has a a very strong vision and a strong determination, and and they have to be willing to go it. Uh, alone a lot. Uh, there seems to be a rite of passage of entrepreneurship, and you have to. But at the same time, you have to involve a team and other people. But it, combined with being um, profoundly um, fo focused on your vision and, and having a maverick mentality, right? So, isn't there some psychology there? Well, there's definitely psychology, and I think you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I created McDonald Ventures because you know I was fortunate enough. I had you know. Over the last couple of decades, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough to have a, you know, a few different exits and successes mm -hmm. along the way. And the lessons that I learn, like relating to things like this is really one of the reasons I wanted to start McDonald Ventures because you, you, you just, it's, it's hard to write a book to encapsulate all of the little nuances that an entrepreneur needs to have and the knowledge that they need to have in order to be successful it's, you know, we're all the center of our own universe. And so when we look out, it's really hard for us to distill all the information that's coming along because we get trapped in this vision that we have for the future of this company that we're going to do. And, you know, we have to be, you know, vision is extremely important. And I'm a huge proponent of having a clear vision and mission and values. But in the very, very early stages of the business, um, You've got to be there. There has to be some level of flexibility, and if you just if you're so stuck on on your vision that you to at the exclusion of practicality, then and and you know I think we both see it, you know, and mm -hmm. and it's really a recipe for failure. Right. So it's, a, it's you have to balance. So good. The really the best entrepreneurs seem to be able to balance this fierce independence with this team player thing, right? Um, yeah. I think right. you've got to, you have to be able to do both. You have to, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's one of the things that one of the philosophies I have is that, you know, we have founders and co-founders and like lots of people say, you know, that they're in a founding co-founding relationship. But if you really boil it down, there's really only one founder and co then you have co-founders because there's one person that drives the the initial vision there's it's the mm -hmm. one person that says hey are you gonna are you gonna be at my house this weekend because we gotta work <laughs> on our business plan hey are you gonna you know and there's you there's typically one person that's that's initiating the call it's gonna be really hard if you're gonna have two people initiating the call having said that that person still has to be able to build a team they've got to be able to um to recruit people and who buy into the entrepreneur's vision and the, co and the founding team's vision. And that's a never ending process of building, you know, not just your company, but building your culture and, and attracting the kind of talent and people that you need. So that whole, you know, you need the person, you need the individual, but that individual has got to be able to work well within a team. And it's and incredible, right? It's incredible to me when I when you break it down like that. It, it's incredible to me about how hard that really is. And yeah, I look back and I and I more and more appreciate how how hard that is by way of um, it, you know everything you said, being the driver, but then also you got to be likable. You got to recruit the team, but then you got to keep the team together by being a reasonably likable and 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 reasonable. Wow, right? <laughs> you got to yeah. you know recruit them, but then you also got to keep them. 
You have to keep right? the one, you know, you got to keep the, you know, to go back to the, the adage of, you know, keeping, you know, the right people on the bus and in the right seats, right? So yeah. if you don't, you know, so even though you got to be able to, to be the cheerleader, you also have to be able to make the tough decisions if they're not the right person on the bus and you got to be able to get rid of them. I feel like we just covered right there a little masterclass on just how hard entrepreneurship is that a lot of people don't think about. They just don't realize the human element of entrepreneurship. Not only do you have to fight the war, you know, the you've, you've got to be you've got to be singularly powerful like a maverick. Right. But then you've also got to be an amazing leader and a team player. And then you've also got to be a great, uh, um, you know, visionary and decision maker. And you got to be willing to you know, even get, you know, fire, get slash, get rid of uh, people that don't fit and gain new people. Like it's mind boggling. And I think that's good for people to hear that there's so much more to entrepreneurship than what you kind of read in the magazines or something like that. There's so much, there's so much complexity and difficulty, which is, we know this is why so many fail. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's still so much of a human element involved. Right. Well, thanks for that opening. That was uh, that was a good strong opening to the uh, to the to the interview. And uh, with that, I'm going to just jump back over. We're going to take a quick deviation and get into um, the, the sponsor we have for the episode. This is Secure Startup. So this is a company I want you to check out, Steve, when you get a chance. So this is a an online platform that manages the documents between <coughs> founders, startup founders, and investors. Right between startup founders and investors. And I know you've you've been a part of a few of these processes of document sharing. Um, and the security involved and the signatures involved. And uh, so securestartup.com is a, is a relatively new company that really focuses on that. Um, not too many uh, platforms do that um, really on a focused way. So uh, not only do I want people watching to check out Secure Startup, but Steve, I want you to check it out soon and give me some, give me your thoughts as well. Because I think it's probably something that you and, and, your, uh, and your, your world of folks could probably use. Sounds compelling, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> That sounds like something, it sounds like something you could use, right? Yeah. <laughs> document the document game with uh, the document game with startups is 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 its own little animal, right? It's, it's a big one, yes. <laughs> right. Everybody's going so, over uh, the documents floating around. Right. You're only yeah, exactly right. Um, all right. So, see with this, I want to um, I want to read a little bio if you don't mind. I want to read your bio. Is that cool? Yeah. Go for it. Okay, cool. So, so in 2001, this is just a slice of your bio. It's not going to be the whole thing. But in 2001, by the way, we're going to come back to 2001 because um, that was that was a pretty uh, rough recessionary time, including 9/11 on top of a recession. So I want to come back to that. But in 2001, uh, Stephen found Steve, not Stephen, founded My Matrix, the first web-enabled pharmacy benefits manager. Um, in May 2017, that looks like about 16 years later. Um, my Matrix sold to Express Scripts, a Fortune 100 company with more than 100 billion in revenues, um, and they were and so you generated a 44x return for your investors. Um, you're a serial entrepreneur and no stranger to exits. Uh, you've also founded and served as the CEO of Tech Health. In 2013, Tech Health was purchased by One Call Management, a portfolio company of Apex Partners. Additionally, you co-founded Mamba Bear Family Safety App that was sold to Grom Social in 2016. Um, so. Prior to his work in startups, uh, Steve was the director and manager of chronic and catastrophic care division for PMS, PMSI, a subsidiary of publicly traded Amerisource Bergen. He also served in the National, in the Air National Guard. Um, so you kind of had this, before you kind of kicked into your, we're going to get into your story, before you kicked in, into your startup game, you, you kind of had this Fortune 100, Fortune 500 uh, experience, which I think is a nice note for people, for young people out there as well, that I'm going to say this right now. I, I truly believe this. One of the best things that a young person can do is to go get an experience in a, in a big company for a few years at least as a almost like a pedigree grab and a connection grab and a learn industry grab. And, and you're also forever taken you know, seriously from a credibility perspective. I could go down the list. I mean, I work with students, as you know, at University of South Florida, and they often wonder, you know, should I go get a job or should I just go be an entrepreneur? And I think that's interesting about your background that, you know, um, and I look at what you did after and you, you were able to kind of like pivot, you were able to like um, just branch out of that world, that industry from a from a Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 company. Um, so in addition, uh, your work with Florida Funders. So you are a partner with Florida Funders and um, and Florida Funders is an, an investment venture capital uh, group in Florida, which, which actually invests throughout the, uh, the state. 
um, and you're on the investment committee there. Um, and, and this is my favorite thing about you. I always brag about you. I say people who ask me about Steve, I go, this guy's invested uh, personally over the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years. You've invested in, I think, either at approaching 100 companies or over 100 companies personally. Yes. Right? I mean, I love that just distinct for people. So is it, is it 100, 100 or is it over 100 now personally? Well, a number I saw in the last couple of days was like about 125 or so. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> do you even laugh at yourself sometimes? First of all, the, the beauty of that is that's the most diversified personal angel investing portfolio that anyone has ever heard of or seen, right? But do you kind of sometimes, I know you're proud of it, but do you sometimes even shake your own head like, that's crazy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think so. Um, but you'd be surprised. Like, there's a, you know, there's different, there's different levels and different um, methodologies around angel investing. You know, and you know, we can get into that, you know, later. But yeah, but um, yeah. So, in, in you know, the past ten years, especially because I was running a company, you know, diversified portfolio theory was kind of the, you know, the, the path I took. Well, Steve, it's not just the path you took. It's the, it's the, it's the correct. I mean, it's the one that everybody should take as an angel investor. You and I have talked about this at length before over coffee and many times. And it's something we, we actually try to preach, for lack of a better word, in the angel investor community in Florida. Uh, I went on, you know, on, a, on a project called Upsurge Florida just last year preaching this message. So many angel investors, when they often you know, either they just come into high net worth or they've been in high net worth for a period and they want to start, they want to, they want to have some fun, right? With an early stage tech, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. And they open themselves up to being, you know, being wooed by a, a, a charismatic tech founder, right? I'm just going to have some fun with this, right? And, uh, and they want to support that founder. They want to support that entrepreneur because they just, they, they want to support entrepreneurship. They, they love the story. They love this per like, and they and they make that investment. Maybe let's call it. Maybe it's six figures. Maybe it's a little less or or so. And they and they check the box that they've been you know. And they don't realize. Well, first of all, they kind of know that the failure risk is high, but but not the, but not for me, <laughs> not the one that I'm doing. And number <laughs> two, um, no one ever told them about the fact that you really should be in multiple pulls of those it, it's not really well known it's surprisingly not well known uh, very few even of the angel investors i personally know i would say even half of them don't really un, don't really think of it they don't think of it that way they think of it as a, a singular event for them that's very um you right you know i just it's very surprising but you didn't you didn't fall trapped to that i don't know how you didn't uh really uh, ignorance really <laughs> so i mean if so, you don't know you know I, the very beginning of the of the angel investing process for me, I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to build relationships and and put my foot into an ecosystem that's brand new to me. So instead of instead of looking for the one company, um, <clears throat> I took the diversified approach and I went out and I met other people who were investing in in startups. And those people that were investing in startups, they were typically called syndicate leads. So they would put together a, a group of investors and let's say they would, they would tell that company, well, we're, you know what, I can raise $300,000 for you and I'd be a part of that. And so a lot of the companies I invested in were not directly invested into the company, um, but they were invested through a different, another relationship that I had with someone who was a professional investor. Um, so it's in this this kind of world. It's it's pre venture. It's it's pre um, institutional venture capital, but it actually is a subset of the overall venture investing community. So let me ask you this: In your first five angel invest investments, go way back, right? Were you already thinking that clearly about diversification, or were you like most in the beginning that you just? said yes to a, you know, a few people because you felt compelled and, and you know, inspired and to, to help and be a part of. And did you, did you already know within your first five that you were going to go for a big number or did it kind of, did you kind of get to that a little later? Uh, well, I, you know, everybody has, their diff has a different number, right? So mm -hmm. I had a number that, that, you know, on the investment side of stuff um, had to be meaningful, you know, to generate some level of real return for me. But there's opportunities for for investors to invest like as little a thousand dollars to three thousand dollars alongside a lot of these syndicate leads, 
um, and really build a good diversified portfolio with people who have taken this this um, category of investing on as as their person is their professional career. It's what they do, you know, 16 hours a day. And so especially if you're going to go in early and you don't have you don't have access to deal flow, you don't have access to um, smart entrepreneurs. You know, what happens is, you know, oftentimes an investor will decide oh, this is I want to get into this angel community and start making some investments and they'll get exposure to one or two. But you're really at that point, you're really not a professional investor in this category and you don't have access to like I literally have I, I probably have access to 300 deals a month, maybe. And so, you know, you've got to. Before you start writing a lot of checks, you know, it's better to try to work on building a, a funnel that gives you good, you know, good high quality deal flow and, you know, co-investing alongside professional investors that you trust and have and have a track record. And, you know, typically in those scenarios, um, you might pay a, pay a 20 percent carry. And for those of the people that don't know what a, a carry is, it's. Um, that person doesn't make any money. That investor makes no money unless there's a profit. And whatever the profit is, let's say I invested, you know, I'm using round numbers, $100,000, and that company sold for a million, then that investor that brought you that deal would get 20% of the 900000 And then you get right, the rest. But right. you didn't have to do any work. I mean, basically, yeah. the work that you did was you went out and you find trusted individuals who had, you know, who were more ingratiated into the ecosystems of smart entrepreneurs, smart investors, and they're, you know, they're doing all of the due diligence and they've built relationships in this ecosystem for a number of years. Most of the people that you know I've, I'm co-investing with have been doing this for 15 or 20 years. Yeah, yeah, and now you're one of those. So um, it's early on, you sounds like you hitched your wagon uh, to, some, to some smart, experienced uh, investors, it sounds like. <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, so far so good, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. By the way, back to profit. A lot of people don't. A lot of people watching don't know all the ins and outs of the the high, the tech you know venture back growth game that that we're part of. A lot of a lot of times is you know you mentioned profit. What most people need to know is that in a in a in a high growth tech company, tech enabled company, or any kind of high growth company, the profit that an investor receives is usually when they sell the company. Just for most people, it's not the kind of profit that you think of in a, a business making a profit. It's usually when they sell the company. You know, it's the difference between uh, you know um, when they when they um, able to receive that income. They have to they divvy up the uh, the the uh, the sale to to the investors, and then that's when you get that uh, <laughs> that investor gets that carried interest, that profit, right? Yep. And so, and it's typically um, you know seven, eight, nine, ten years before you realize any gains in that environment. Yeah, so I appreciate you, gotta, you saying that. <laughs> you got to be willing to, to, to go along for the ride. I pre that's another thing we talked we talk about a lot that that people that in early that yeah that uh, the um, the unadulterated or the the new uh, investors don't fully understand either. And again, I, it's important that they hear is that I like to say you know five to eight. I, I appreciate you saying nine to eight to nine to ten, right? Because it's better to be surprised, right? When it comes in sooner, it's better to have right to. Um, to you know, set your expectations out there, and then be surprised if it comes in sooner. Yeah, you know, there's certainly there's the Googles of the world, um, you know, that have mm -hmm. like immediately explosive growth, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem that I grew up in, and most of my peers, we we all for the most part, we didn't hit, um, we weren't really accelerating until like the seventh year. And it's pretty wow. consistent. It's like six, seven, eight years before we, you know, we really started to recognize this explosive growth. And like a lot of times, let's say you're an investor mm -hmm. in a company, they start to hear that, you know, escape, you know, it's called escape velocity, right? So they start to hit that escape velocity. And then like lots of these entrepreneurs want to hit the eject button immediately. Cause now once you hit escape velocity, like now you've got real venture capital interest, you've got real acquisition offers and, lots of entrepreneurs are like, you know, the first time in their life they've been offered a seven figure check and they just held on for a few more years. You know, that's probably going to be an eight figure check. Right. And if you're really good at it, maybe it's a nine figure check or, or better. Um, 
So, you know, that's also on the investing side, trying to understand the psychology of, of the entrepreneur and, you know, are they going to hit eject before they should, or are they going to, you know, they're going to really going to try to ride it out. What's, what's their motivation? That's uh, that's, this is great stuff you're throwing down, Steve. This is stuff that people just don't know about or talk about enough is where things are at years five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, and you mentioned the founder side. That's, that's a really interesting angle. I always talk about the investor side I, because I always, most angel investors that I interact with have this, you know, two, one, two, three year feel, you know, a, a feeling expectation that they just come in with, right? They're thinking about real estate or other their stocks or thinking about other things they've done, right? And they just have, a, you tell them, I, in fact, we need to scare, we, it's good because we, if I scare you off with this whole five, five to 10 years thing, then uh, we've kind of done, we've done a good service to you as a potential investor, right? Absolutely. It's probably you know. not for you. Right. So that's great. And out of, Steve. Out of all of those investments, I've had maybe two exit within four years of starting the company. Right. Out of like a, like we're looking at a hundred approximately two. You said four or two. You said four. Two. 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 You said two within four years. So two percent. Yeah, exited yeah. within that period of time. So having the, and, and and the other thing I say about that. So there's that. To me, that there's again it, from the investor perspective, the good it does news a lot. On that, though, the, sorry to interrupt, but the good news on that is the ones that aren't going to work, you typically kind of find out within a year or two, like they're going to close, mm -hmm. and at least you don't have to like invest any more mental energy around around those founders of those companies. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and and what I was going to say is that um, it also funny word but it to me it has it can have a way of relaxing the investor once they understand that and they understand the runway the time frame involved because instead of you know having panicky investors on years two three four five which you know what i'm talking about which is no good for them and no good for the companies right it can be pretty destructive honestly for themselves and the companies when they get very panicky because why they had they had bad expectations you know they get into year three four five and they see the company not doing the 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 huge uh, escape velocity and they and they uh, you know, can get can get panicky when, in fact, that's just the time when you have to stay calm, especially if the company is progressing, if the company is is tracking well, right? Mm -hmm. it's important. It's an important window that three to five years when uh, I feel like it's even the founder test. I feel like it's a it's an investor test. It's a founder test. Is can you stick with it during that period, right? Because it feels like we should be a lot further along in three to five years, right? You, that's how it feels. You know, you kind of get beat yourself up, and the investor gets a little like, uh, and then, but, but in reality, and you look back, the reality, that's the gut check time for the company, isn't it? Yeah, that's um, building a. You know, this is a long game. So anybody that wants a quick fix on this, you know, go to the casino. <laughs> you know. You roll right. your dice with some Bitcoin investments. I don't know, but this, you know, <laughs> the investing in entrepreneurs and investing in early stage companies is a long game. And whether you're the entrepreneur or the investor, you know that's something that you have to be prepared for. And and I would urge all. I mean, you you've made some great points. I would urge people who are thinking of dipping their toe into this, if you can't tolerate the um, the long life cycle for, for, for seeing a return, do everybody, do all of us a favor and stay out because it is destructive to other investors on the cap table. It's destructive to the, the entrepreneur who's trying to build a business. And, you know, my advice is, you know, find something that is, is, is more right. timely for you and your, and your, and your goals. Absolutely. I mean, look at real estate, look at stocks, look at look at traditional, you know, businesses that have, you know, traditional type business models, all that stuff is out there. Right. This is a different game. Right. This is a different game. And let's, it's worth saying, why would why would we play a long game? Let's, let's go ahead and put this on the table. The big why. Right. Because this is where the big home runs can happen. Let's just at least put the happy, the not the happy. Let's put the, the why on this. Right. Because it is a long haul, but there's a big why as to why it's worth waiting for. Um, you know, I have not all, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> no, it doesn't always happen, but I've got, you know, I've got a couple friends who invested in the first stage of Uber. They put 25,000 or $50,000 in 
literally turned into a hundred million dollars for the twenty five thousand dollar investment and the fifty was you know a couple hundred million dollars like there is no way and that's why you have to have a diversified portfolio because you don't know which one is gonna be that you know deca corn right so which is the one that's going to give you five thousand you know percent return on your money or ten thousand it just yeah and you're just that's you're just not going to find that in real estate or um the public mm -hmm. markets and yeah you know and you may never find it here but that's the exciting part right and it, and then yeah. in those situations where as you know previous entrepreneurs and um investors with experience in this hopefully we can help you know accelerate that path and remove some obstacles for those you know for those those really phenomenal founders that will get them to those levels well that's going to be a, that's a good segue into what we're going to talk about next um so you know and by the way before we get into the next person this this everything you've just said is is really why you created mcdonald ventures right like this is what your new phase of your life is because you know you sold your company just a couple years ago and you've you know you've um you know kind of plugged in as a mentor the tampa bay wave and embark and other places and you and you've you mentored and advised with lots of companies you've done a lot of things in the last few years but it seems like uh, you're getting, you've been organizing something uh, that's going to be um, coming out pretty big later this year. That's going to be called McDonald Ventures. What's what's going to be the uh, the essence of McDonald Ventures? Yeah, so, uh, you like like you were saying, you know, it's really it's an opportunity for me to deploy capital and some um, some really exceptional founders that are building you know phenomenal technology companies. It's a way for me to share the experience and be a part of building the next generation of, of fantastic companies and, and the and ideas that right now are just you know they're just seed ideas and they're just they're just people in garages trying to tinker with the next you know the next new facebook or or <clears throat> you know shopify or whatever right zoom that was I was going to say, God knows we need a new Facebook, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well said. That would have been a joke a couple of years ago. That would have been a joke because they'd be like, we don't need another Facebook. We've got one. We've got one. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. I think now it, that, that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, I want to jump into something else. So I, uh, when we were putting this together, um, you apparently have identified five founder characteristics that you look for. And these are, this is from you and I want to read them out to you and I want you to walk through each of them, right? Um, five founder characteristics that, that you look for. Um, you know, number one, realistic. Number two, humility. Number three, traction. Number four, prepared. And number five, commitment. So let's start with realistic. What do, what do you mean by realistic for a founder? So realistic is, You've got to have a realistic um, expectation when you're talking to uh, investors. And you also have to be realistic with your teams and your employees and your market and you know, all of the different things that, that go into that. You know, is it, for instance, you know, on the investor side of stuff, and I was guilty of this when I started my first company. You know, I had the big job from the public, you know, the publicly traded company. I ran a division and I thought, well, whomever the investor is should be happy to have me. So I want a big salary. So we were going out and we were asking for, you know, like $150,000 in salary. And the guys were like, are you out of your mind? I'm like putting money into this idea, this company. I'm not, I'm not going to give you and not just me, my other, you know, the partners that were starting this. So we're just going to stuck $450,000 out of the the company in the first year just to pay your salaries that doesn't really work and you know we get that too i you know recently have met with somebody and they were you know un you know unfortunately in this situation they were a couple and their their salary expectations were two hundred thousand dollars each for a startup and you know i pushed back on it they said well this is what we're worth in the market and i'm like yeah but this is a startup like, and go get a job. <laughs> if that's what you are worth at work in the market, then you just go get a job there that it doesn't work that way. So, you know, 
and basically, you know, from that st standpoint, those co those conversations are over, right? And yeah. um, and then it's it, it's a detriment to that founder because as an investor, especially in a community like Tampa, right? We're a small community, small investors. We talk, and so every, when when there's deal flow and people are saying that, you know, well, you know, we're sharing the the, the feedback. Mm -hmm. we're, we're giving feedback to our co-investors about what the expectations were and how unrealistic they were. So that it's a really negative um, mark on that potential founder, right? So right, right, the other right. thing like in realistic is going in with a proper valuation. You can't come in with just, you know, with a business plan. And well, most of the time you can't come in with just a business plan <laughs> and get a $20 million valuation. Um, I was able to actually do that in the in the in the dot com boom bust era, but then the flip side of that was we did get a huge valuation on a business plan, and then when we ran out of money, I know where um, you're going. <laughs> we got you know massively diluted, yes, and ultimately I ended up getting fired. So like you know, there's consequences for you know what sounds good today may not actually be in the best interest, and so I, you know. You know, having realistic expectations and how that plays into the long term vision and strategy for your for your business is really, really important. Oh, man, I, I just some of the stuff you hit on is, is so many. There's many tough lessons in there that I even had to learn myself as well. And uh, and I w wish I could go back and, and do some things differently with that myself by way of everything you've covered. And um, because the, the key to that, both of those stories is even if you do pull them off um, higher salary than, you know, the company really can afford or. Um, a higher valuation than the company should really have. If you are looking to pull those off, you're, you're unfortunately you're putting a uh, you're putting a, you're putting yourself in a big vulnerable position, maybe even a, a bullseye position for being you know removed, you know, because that's an expensive. You become something very expensive to the company. Number one, and if the valuation is is too high, you can feel good. You know, that's an ego. Pat yourself on the back. We're, we're, I had to learn that when I first started. I thought the more the higher the valuation I could put on my company and. That was, but I, but what we don't, what we, but what I learned later is that what's really important when it comes to investors is with this thing called up rounds and not down rounds, right? And this, you're really, my job as a CEO and a founder is to produce up rounds uh, for my investors. So if, if I knew that fully, I would, I would want to sandbag for lack of a better word. If I understand that fully is the, if that was, if I knew that was really the game, which I didn't because, you know, you learn these things too late and you look back and I would have been, oh, whoa, wait, if that's my true job, let's 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 start let's keep this let's start with a low valuation because i want to come out of the gate already ahead and and every you know in a year i didn't have to hardly you know i already know i'm ahead of the game with you know just interesting that you don't we don't know the, the most founder first time founders don't know this stuff yeah you know one of the things on that is is you enter in this as a first time founder the idea is that you should set yourself up for success and sometimes setting yourself up for success may mean that you know in the in the area of valuation that you do take on you do take a lesser valuation because if you take on too much if you take on too high a valuation or too early it's going to be hard to backfill all of the expectations to get there and there's so many obstacles and challenges that for, for founder entrepreneur just to add mm -hmm. that you know add that to the mix is it, it's mm -hmm. kind of an unnecessary obstacle that you're placing in front of yourself yeah absolutely that's a big one so that's realistic so he, he, humility we we kind of already know where you're going to go with this one but humility and a founder yeah so humility is it's it's pervasive in lots of different aspects of of the the person themselves and yeah you know like <clears throat> having an ivy league education is is is, is a great thing, you know, that, that you were able to get your, get the grades and put yourself in an environment that you have been able to, to come out of and, you know, and prosper. And it's a really awesome, great foundation. But if you, if you're, if that's the lead of your pitch and like, you want to talk mm. about that more than you want to talk about your business, that doesn't mm. send a good signal to the potential investor. And so part of the humility thing, it's, it's part of the personality that enables somebody to track the right investors. It enables you to build a good, solid team because people want to be with people that they like. And if you're egotistical and you know everything, 
people don't want to be around you. And so it's really, it, it, it's really detrimental to the company. And then going back to the, the idea, you know, that we're all the center of our own universe. It's really, oftentimes it's really hard for people to understand that maybe I'm not humble. And, you know, so having the ability to, on the humility side, this is something, and I know you see it, and Alan, because we talk about it all the time, like the number of founders that we see who aren't getting an investment, and then they blame some other existential factor, like, well, the investors right. here aren't sophisticated, or yeah. they don't get the me they don't get what we're trying to do. They don't understand. Um, you know, they we should be funded by now. Well, in those situations, people are not they're not introspecting themselves and asking them, themselves the questions. What am I missing? Why right. do people not see what I see? And if yeah. you can be humble enough to 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 look inwardly and not blame the people that you're that you're pitching to for not investing, yeah. you're going to get a long way with that. You know, the you know, the best the best analogy I have for that, Steve, is like a, the reason why people don't buy your product. You know, uh, right. Like like if you had a physical product, right, if you had a physical product you were selling and, and people and you and it was on the shelf and people weren't buying it, would you start attacking the customers for not buying? Right. You, you, you wouldn't because it's an object and you would be like, something's wrong with the product. Something's wrong. I don't know why they're not buying it. We've got to figure it out. Right. And we don't blame the customers. We, we, we know there's a problem and it could be just a small thing. Right. It could be a pri it could be the price. <laughs> it could be a color. It could be. And it's interesting that we have a hard time as a startup founder, especially first time founders. And um, we have a hard time seeing ourselves as a product because what are investors really doing? Not as, a lot of people don't really see it, don't understand this either. Investors are fundamentally buying something. People forget. They're they just I think people forget. I wish sometimes we would use the word. Sometimes when I'm working with founders, I use the word selling and buying when I talk about work, talking with investors, because if you can't sell it, if they're not buying, you're not. It's either your product in the whole package of you and everything. It could be your company. It could be the whole thing. They're not buying for a reason, and uh, and you and and you've got to be like you said. You've got to be objective enough to go figure out why they're not buying and not blame the not blame the buyer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The non-buyer. The non-buyer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I think it's great. I think it's a great way to. It's uh, yeah. It's it's just interesting the the emotional component to it, right? Um, it, founders often can't separate. It's it take, it's it's hard to not take it personal, isn't it? Right? It, you you I'm sure when you were many times when you were building your companies, raising capital, starting, it was really hard to take rejection. It was hard to not take it personal, right? Yeah, it is personal. It's your baby, so you know. But it's <laughs> in. Um, but the number of times I would have to go back to. Like in my, my, in working with my my teams, my staff, the interpersonal conflict that would arise out of teams, and the number of times I found myself saying, "It's not personal, don't take it personally," was you know, I, I mean, I'm trying to teach them that, but at the same time, it is personal. Like it's you know, and being mm. a founder, it is personal because this thing is like you sprung from your brain, and you can't help it. And you got to take care of it. And you, you poured yourself, it. and you, and you poured yourself into it. And frankly, you've put yourself way out on the line. And so it's especially hard. It hurts really, really hurts a lot extra when you're rejected. When you've, and when when it's something that you you've poured yourself and you've put yourself on the line for. But you probably, again, back to your point earlier, you you probably botched the the message somehow, right? I hate to say it that way, but. No one's taken away from you from the fact that you aren't on the line and you haven't sacrificed everything and they probably your product and so but but if you don't have humility, you're basically botching the message and you're not letting the buyer buy. You're not letting the investor invest because of it. Yeah. The you know, when you use the terms buying, the you know, what the investor and what the entrepreneur needs to understand is that the investor is buying an opportunity. That's what they're looking for. And they're buying the opportunity. Typically, they're buying the opportunity to generate a larger return in this investment than they expect to generate in a real estate transaction or in the public stock market or something like that. And so if, if you understand that the person is buying an opportunity, the opportunity that they're buying from you, from the entrepreneur, is relative to the other opportunities 
that the investor is seeing. It doesn't even necessarily mean that your opportunity is a bad one. It's just that, you know, for somebody who has access to hundreds of deals or thousands of deals, how does your opportunity stack up to the other opportunities an investor has? And it's the entrepreneur's job to demonstrate that their opportunity and that they, as the entrepreneur, are the one with the highest chance of generating the outsized return that the investor is looking for. And what's funny about that statement, it's their job to convince and persuade that, but but then to not transfer that and translate that into, you know, overconfidence and arrogance and to somehow do what you just said with humility. Again, yes. the 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 diff the things that entrepreneurs and founders have to do and pull off, people do not realize how hard that is to do to actually you've got to become like you said, a one percenter uh, with by and using humility to do it. Most people can't do it. And so that's again, it's just it's it's incredible. And by the way, like that's why second and third time founders start getting it. You know, they start getting it a little later. Right. Mm -hmm. um, third traction. So this is the third thing you said uh, for founder characteristics you look for in founders. And if you're looking at an early stage company, you look and these kind of speaks for itself. But traction. What do you what do you define that as? Yeah, so traction, and, and it also goes back to um, realistic and expectations. So if you, are, mm -hmm. if you are a person with an idea <clears throat> or business plan, and you're going out to someone who is, quote unquote, a professional investor, you're probably not going to get any, any interest. And, but you know, typically, so if you're, if you're at the stage where you're trying to found an idea, you're typically going to friends or family, people that know you, know about you, know your personality, know, you know, and then they have confidence in you as an individual. And once you've done that, you've, you know, you probably have created a minimum viable product. So once you've got to a minimum viable product, then you can come out to a group of like angels or professional angels or professional investors and demonstrate that you have a minimum viable product. And typically, a minimum viable product will have at least like, you know, you will have generated some users, maybe not revenue. Revenue is much better if you're generating revenue. But at least you have something that demonstrates that you've introduced your product to the market and people are using it. They're looking at it. They're buying it. They're, they're engaging with it. Um, maybe, you know, if it's, a, if it's a consumer app, like how long does some, you know, like a game, like how long is somebody engaging with with my product all of those things are are metrics that we look at and and assess like how much traction does does a product or company have and so that traction really uh translates into uh validity right it's a it's a validation question isn't it you know really at that point because early on it's really hard for anybody i don't care if you're an investor or even if you're a friend of whoever you are if you're outside the company you can't uh, you 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 uh, it's you should be careful to not trust your senses. What you see, touch and smell may not be what it feels and smells and looks like. Right. Like but traction is traction. Traction has a way of cutting through if it's real or not, because traction means somebody bought it, is using it or took it on. And that has a way of just answering the question, doesn't it a little bit? Well, it's the social proof. It's yeah. the proof that that somebody beyond yourself has said, hey, this is interesting. Right. And that's and that and that's kind of a big box to check for an early stage investor, right? Mm hmm. Um, OK, number four, prepared. OK, so uh, number four, you look for in a founder is, is are they prepared? And, and I think I wrote down here, right, the right team in place, right? That was part of preparation you're thinking of as well. Uh, definitely the right team. Um, team is, is super important. The, um, <clears throat> I think the, 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 the thing on team though is team is relative oftentimes to where you are geographically. Like it's harder to find, you know, stellar tech talent and in Brandon than it is in, you know, in Silicon Valley, right? So yeah. um, having, having the right team is, is important, but Having the right structure of the company, and it, it, I think is is sometimes understated 
and equally as important. Like how, how good of a leader is the leader and can that leader maximize the potential from the team that they, they've built? And, and I think like oftentimes, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but oftentimes people will, they'll just hire somebody with a particular domain expertise and then they just expect that that person is going to do all of the things that the the founder couldn't do themselves and then they get disappointed when the results don't 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 materialize right and yeah. it, there's still a responsibility of the founder to work with those individuals and so by preparation what i mean by that is in in, in some respects is that the founder is prepared to set the right and understand they're asking all the right questions and they're establishing the right metrics, the key performance indicators, KPIs that are going to, that are going to demonstrate to the individuals in the organization that they are achieving their goals or they're not achieving their goals. Um, so we use KPIs or OKRs objectives and key results as one of those things that demonstrate you know, preparedness. And so when an entrepreneur is talking to a potential investor, if they don't understand how they measure success in their business, like what does success look like in my business? If they don't have that understanding, that's a huge, huge, huge red flag. Um, you know, I, there was one is just uh, as an, as a, for instance, the other day I saw a deal. It was a, gr you know, a really super interesting company and they, you know, they actually had some traction. They had a lot of the things actually in place, but when it came time for the fundraising, they literally, they had no idea. They had not prepared any, you know, to the level that they were looking, you know, to raise money at. They just were completely unprepared. And so mm -hmm. as an investor, you know, I looked mm -hmm. at it and, you know, we shared it amongst ourselves and we, a couple of us looked at it and we're like, Okay, red flag, red flag, red flag. I can't, you know, regardless of whatever they've done on the other side, this is an important skill that you have to understand. And if you're not prepared when you come to talk to us, then don't talk to us. You're almost saying, I almost hear you saying, I think this is what I'm, I definitely know I'm hearing you say this, that no matter how great the product or the, 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 the concept is, I mean, it can be amazing, right? Um, and even the team, to your point, can be like really look good. It could be, it could be actually one of the most interesting things you've seen in a long time. It could actually be a 1% kind of a, in your, in your looks, but if, if they aren't, uh, if they aren't thinking the way you just described, and if they aren't, if they aren't coming prepared, like really taking you seriously and taking the estimate raising seriously. And, and, and that means prepared, taking it seriously means you're going to prepare and, you know, having humility with that, then you're out. And, and that's interesting for people to hear that, because most of most founders early, especially first time founders early, you know, you they they really in their minds think that they're going to love this. They're going to invest this. They, they get there. It's all about they're going to love it and they're going to want to invest. And and a lot of unsophisticated early stage investors can get caught in that. Right. Um, but but the but the smart ones uh, uh, will pass. They'll pass. Yes. And, you'll, and, it'll, and it'll actually shock you when they do. It'll shock you. I've, I've had it shock me many times. Yeah. You know, because it's. It's super easy for even if it's a great product for the founders to get you know over their skis, and you know take on like a a debt structure or an equity structure or some other thing that you know as an angel investor you don't have control over, and you may you you know you might find yourself at the at the um, in the unfortunate situation of a company being restructured and all of your preferred shares being pushed down to common at a down round and the next thing you know what. And the company's still like, you know, it's doing a hundred million dollars, but your the the value of your equity is basically zero now, just because of some other unfortunate financing events that have t have occurred in the company. And like, okay, well, yeah, all of those other things were good, but at the end of the day, there was a you missed a big huge component Didn't of take what care. it takes to Didn't generate return. Yeah, what it takes to generate returns for your investors. Mm -hmm. And didn't quite, uh, and it gets back to respect and preparation for your investors, right? You know, respect, right. You know, respect and preparation and, go hand in hand. And and listen, there is the outlier entrepreneur. It's typically the one who is like, you know, um, 
they were the head of, you know, maps or something at Google, right? Or they were head of autonomous driving at Google or something like that, or Facebook or something, right? And that person said, hey, I'm going to go out and start a company. But because of the, the job they held and because of the relationships they have with investors already, that's the one or two, you know, there's probably maybe 10 people a year out of the whole United States. They can, they can kind of get away category. with it. They can kind of get away with uh, get yeah, away with it. The, yeah, it's just because of who they are and the and and how much. But I would argue, I would argue, I would argue, they still probably have to have some humility about them. I would even that even yes. those those examples. If they if they don't have some humility, they probably still can't get away with it. I mean, right. you know, in other words, they can get away with maybe not being as prepared and you know not being. Uh, but but um, they still can't be uh, they can't be arrogant jerks. Right. Yep. Not not gonna uh, that's not gonna fly. Okay, last one, number five, commitment. Now this this is a you know commitment, right? That's a that's like a, that's right in the playbook of of things that if an entrepreneur doesn't have, we're in trouble. How how do you look at commitment? <laughs> I mean, it was probably actually number one. It's not really. Yeah, it's probably five. number one. <laughs> um, yeah. But you have to be you have to have perseverance. You know, you're gonna like being. You know, being an entrepreneur is like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson every single day for 10 years. <laughs> and like, you know, you just some days you wake up and you get punched in the face and you like get up and you're like kind of staggering around and like what just, you know, what the hell just happened to me? Right. And yeah, but it's those people that just they, they you know, they get punched in the face and then they're laying on the ground and they're like, I haven't had enough yet. Hit me again. I haven't had enough. Hit me again. And like over and over and over, you just. You know, and, you know, at the time, it doesn't really seem like you're maybe the most um, level headed or logical person. But, you know, those are the kinds of risks that you take for the big reward. And the, the commitment side of it is the person who's just willing to just get punched in the face every day. And and, you know, they come out and then they win the fight. We're all, you know, we're the Buster Douglas. Right. Nobody saw that happening. It's because they kept getting in, the, in that case. They kept getting back up. Which, by the way, I, I, he had to get back up in that fight. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't remember that. You know that Buster Douglas was the first person, the first man to defeat Mike Tyson, and and uh, recently revisited that for some reason. And uh, I forgot that he got knocked down by Mike Tyson in, in the midway in that fight. And and after Mike Tyson just destroyed so many people, you'd think that would have been his. Uh, hey, I'm. I'm I'm one foot out the door here. It's odd. everybody knows that, you know. But right. no, he got up. He got yep. up and went on to. <laughs> who knows how that was possible, right? Yeah. So those are the five, Steve. Anything else on commitment? No, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Commitment <laughs> kind of works for itself, doesn't it? Um, I, the uh, Steve, what I'm starting to realize just for time, I think we're going to go about another ten minutes or so. I'm going to ask for a part two. Because I don't plan to get into your backstory from this this interview. This has got this has been so juicy and so good, especially around investing. That um, I don't want to I don't want to um, cut it short, and I don't want to. Uh, when I get into the backstory, that's there's a whole nother feel for that, right? And if you don't mind, would you be willing to come back and do another one with me on that? Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, because um, I don't want to kill this momentum we've got because this is I think this is powerful stuff that a lot of people need to hear. Um, I you know I wanted to ask you about. Um, this whole idea of uh, uh, looking for investors, and this is one of my favorite sayings, and you and you know it too. About um, when you're going out to you know raise capital or try to find someone to invest in your company, um, two things I want you to touch on. Number one, uh, do you need connections? And number two, uh, how do you ask for money? Okay. <laughs> um, Just reposition it. Well, let's get it comfortable on this one. Yeah. Well, the the. <laughs> You know, the first part of the question is, do you need connections? And the, the, mm -hmm. the simple answer is yes. But the longer answer is that you don't have to have connections when you start the process. And in fact, lots of people don't. Um, for me, my personal experience, you know, when we talk about the background, I, you know, I grew up, I was public schools, Zephyr Hills. I didn't have, you know, I didn't come for money. Grew up in a trailer park in the Orange Grove, you know. I was the first person out of my whole family of like 40 people, you know, extended relatives and stuff to go to college. So that was not something I did not have those connections. 
And so, but if you're going to do this, you know, so you're like, okay, well, if I'm going to start a company and I need money, how do I, how do I do that? And, you know, the first company I started was 1999 was tech health. And we, because just because I was ignorant and I didn't know any better, I just was like, okay, well, um, who do I know that has any money? Not a lot of people, but so-and-so's dad's a lawyer. Maybe he has some money. So I'd like call him and say, Hey, you know, can I, you know, can I buy a cup of coffee? And I was, and I just did this over and over and, and legitimately I was not going to him and asking for any money. I was explaining, this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to build this company. This is the kind of company I'm building. What would you do if you were me? Do you, you know, do you, do you have any contacts in this, in the medical space that we were building out? Do you have a, any banker relationships? You know, do you know anybody that would, or that in, that is, is interested in, in, and investing in startups. And over and over and over, I would just go and I would ask these people for advice. And inevitably, um, that network that I built was, um, you know, over not maybe like eight, six, eight months or so, I was actually re- able to raise $5 million for the first round of our financing. And it was really all about um, going out and asking people for advice not asking for n- not asking for investments and you know now that i'm on the other side of that there's a there's a saying that investors have and it's you know if you ask for advice you know if you ask for money you're probably going to get advice if you ask for advice you might find your way to some money yeah <laughs> yeah we say this there's a shorter version ask for advice you get money Ask for money, you get advice. It's the same, yeah. But it's it's <laughs> it's great, and it always the first time uh, the first time a uh, uh, first time founder hears that it always stuns them. I love it when I, I love putting it on them because I get to work with a lot of these younger kids, you know, and and uh, in my, even in my classroom at USF, and and it always makes people just rock some hard, and they and it and it's quite a powerful little message, and um and it but it it, it gets to the psychology of of things, right? I, I, it, let's be real, nobody wants to be. Um, nobody wants to be used just for their money or need, like if you're, if it's, it's kind of the way I hate to say it this kind of way, but it's, it starts with how you make the investor feel like you, do you, like, are you like, do you, um, it's a little bit like dating, right, Steve? I mean, come mm-hmm. on, it is. I mean, it's like, do you, you know, I mean, I'm, I, uh, you know, I'm not a bank per se. Like I'm, I'm interested in, in people and interesting, co- I'm talking about the investor, right? I'm interested in people and companies and relationships and I have a lot to offer. I'm, I've been very successful. I have a lot of experience. I'm, I'm not here to over, over uh, uh, coach or, you know, or dominate, but at the same time, um, you know, if you're gonna part, if you're gonna ask someone to part with a lot of their personal hard earned money, um, you, you, you need to um, a treat them with respect, but also uh, recognize that the most valuable thing that person should be able to give you is um, is experience and, like you said, advice. And and frankly, that advice often I often take another step and go that advice should turn into um, uh, actually turns into more connections, right? Mm-hmm. So I would almost say ask for advice, uh, get more connections, and you know the money just like you said earlier, the money will show up at will show up naturally in that flow. Yeah, you know, but it's, again, that goes back to the humility part, right? Because if you are doing this and it's kind of obvious to the person you're having a conversation with that, it, that it's just a ploy, right? Mm-hmm. And then, all the, and, you know, before the, before the meeting is over, you know, the very first meeting, they, you know, they brought out their cap table and their investment thesis and all this other stuff. And it was like, hey, man, I just thought we were like going to like have a conversation, you know? And so you're kind of like, okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you scared this one off. All right. So, you know, you got to you got to. Well, the other side of the coin, are, it's, it, it's just it's a sales process and you have to understand the process of selling in order to close the deal. And I know and I know you see this as well. How many founders expect to get a check out of one meeting? <laughs> right. This is not, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you're, you know, this is time about lots of money. Like you're not going to get a check yeah. in one meeting. It's a, it's a, you have to build a relationship. Yeah. That's so, man, that is just a, just a message that has to get burned in really, really deep into the entrepreneurial world. And, um, I just want to, I love that you brought that up. It, it's, it's, um, it's just, it's, it's so it gets lost and, and, uh, and 
it takes, it should take, it should, hopefully it's something you've built up over years and it definitely is going to take months. And to your point, um, you, your, your job is to get them to know, like, and trust you first. Right. And, yep. uh, and, and let them feel a part. And also they need to feel a part of your journey a little bit. Right. Um, so I think that's, I appreciate you sharing that about, um, about, you know, connections and, um, you know, how to ask, uh, ask for the money, which really you, you, uh, you, you don't, you don't per right. se. Now to that point, I want to ask you, um, is there a point at some when point you uh, have to ask? Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah let's talk yeah, about that. At some point, at some point you've got to know that you, you got to be able to read and read the signals that you've done the hard work of building the relationship, haven't you? And you can, you got to be able to read the body language and the signals from that, from that investor that you've actually, you've done that hard work over the course of, of time. And now you actually need to ask for the money, but right. So the, this is an interesting concept. So investing and raising money is a lot like herd mentality. And, you know, if you've got one, you know, one steer in the herd that's going to, you know, run over the cliff and then all the other ones come and they follow, right? Just blindly follow along. But there needs to be the first one. And getting, a, getting investors is a lot like that. So yeah. typically... In that scenario, you will have, you know, you'll have met with one or two people. You're kind of like in the process, you're, you're creating an expectation. The guy, the person that you're, you're meeting with understands that it's some, you know, you, you're looking for an investment, right? Um, but you're not, you're not beating him, over, him or her over the head with that. The, but as you go along through the process and you take advantage of the connections that they offer and you go meet with, with those people, and over a time now, you've built, you know, like one person might give you five connections and then that person might give you five more connections and then that person might give you five more connections. And so n next thing you know, you've met with 25 people but based out of like a small group, the init initial group of like, you know, three people or so. And as you start to have more and more conversations with, with the potential investors within that group, and they start to get comfortable, they start having conversations amongst each other. And then, then what happens is the one person says, hey, what do you think about that McDonald guy and his idea? You gonna write a check? Uh, I'm pretty close, what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking about it too. Well, if you write one, I'll write one. Okay, well, what about Bob over there? <laughs> you talk to Bob, what's his opinion? And like, that's how it works. Like. The, just to get the one rogue investor to write the check is really, really hard. You got to get a group of people that are associated with each other. And if you can, if you can get a couple right. people on the hook to say, yes, I, I'm really thinking about that. It'll start this like cascading event. And then the next thing you know, right. all of those people are writing you a check. And, and what's powerful about that, Steve, is that, What's interesting about that is that your job is to just set those conditions to get the balls rolling and to set the conditions and to let those guys or gals, women, men um, sell themselves on you. That's basically what you just said. Right. Because yeah. that's going to be the most powerful thing, the way it'll come together. Um, and when you start thinking about that way, now you look at it as a founder. And if you that changes your perspective, now your job, to your point, is to go have as many cordial, informative of your job is to um, communicate the right body language and messaging and the preparation, you, everything but the, the asking for the money, get enough of those particles moving, those connections, and then let let some things happen for you um, behind the scenes. And that's really, and, and that's, but and again, I think, I think if more found, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're the conductor. I was going to say, if more founders truly knew that going in, they, we all, they, the first time founders, they just, they just plow in, right? They don't, and it's just, it's a mess. It's usually a mess. They're usually overconfident, underconfident, too, like they mess it up all over the place. And, and even the ones that come across uh, arrogant really aren't arrogant people, but they just tried to be something they weren't. It's just a mess, right? We try to yep. coach them on this, right? <laughs> and it's yep. unfortunate, right? But in the end, it's, it's pretty simple. If they listen to this podcast and watch stuff like this, they realize that, your job is to be authentic, be prepared, um, connect with quality people, set enough things in motions, and then let let uh, let these prospects coalesce and and collect themselves. And even if they don't talk to a lot of people, I would even argue that a, an investor needs time to even reflect and think and 
and, and, and your job is to give them that space. Like that stuff they just don't teach. They just yep. don't teach stuff. And, you know, keep them updated, you know, keep, you know, don't over update them, but keep them updated of the progress that you're making. Wow. This is good. Uh, let me hit on one more thing before we, we wrap this up. Um, this is going to be a little masterclass for a lot of a lot of young aspirant, aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, I can tell you that. Um, so let me let me end this, uh, Steve, with just asking about. Um, you know, the idea of what you you're going to look for with with McDonald Ventures. And let's talk about you specifically with McDonald Ventures that's going to be uh, going forward. Um, other than the things we talked about, what kind of products and technology and sectors and things like that do you think you, you're going to like in the team and your investment team are going to like? Uh, so my my background, the businesses that I built were were mostly um, companies that we were technology enabled so we would go into like business process automation so we'd follow like phone calls and paper and anytime there was an opportunity to automate the phone calls or the paper those were the things that um rise that percolate to the top of my investing thesis uh it doesn't mean that you know we don't i don't invest in other things but i typically don't i shy, I shy away from things that are pure tech um, and like, you know, um, biotech things that, you know, have like, you know, 15 year timeline to try to get, you know, drug, you mm -hmm. know, to market and stuff like that. So those are not the kinds of investments I do. And, and like I said, they're more like things that um, have a real life tangible, um, ex you know, personal experience associated with that. And, and things that typically automate or eliminate you know, manual labor. Right. So so uh, you're going to always uh, perk up when it comes to business process automation, um, technology that's actually solving, probably solving a problem in, a comp in, a, in an industry or within a company, right? business to business primarily, you would think you would see, you would imagine you would yeah, see it's, it, that? It's, yeah, 99% B2B. SaaS it's software you know, SaaS software, things like that. Let's talk about that to educate people out there a little bit about the uh, the reason why B2C, which is business to consumer for those listening, um, B, B2B means that you're you're going to build something that other companies are going to buy. So that's business to business. You're going to you're going to build you're going to create something that other companies going to buy. Or if you're business to consumer B2C, which is what everybody walking around the, the the streets understand about entrepreneurship, they think of like like you know Uber is B2C. So if you're going to build something, uh, Facebook of course, on and on that the consumers are going to use, that's B2C. Maybe touch on a little bit why. And you're not alone, by the way, why, why it's a little harder to raise money, especially outside of the Silicon Valley. It's a little harder to raise money for B2C products. Yeah, I mean, it's honestly, it's like nearly virtually impossible to raise money B2C outside. Um, the B2C, it's, you know, this is a, we're talking about social proof. That is, um, it's really hard to collectively on the sidelines pick and choose what's going to, you know, what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, there's a, you know, there's a big graveyard of really smart B2C companies and B2C entrepreneurs ju just because they couldn't get the, the, the traction that they were hoping to, to establish early on. I mean, the story behind Twitter was they, you know, for those that don't know the story, they, they started off as like a video blog. And they, um, at some point, Evan Williams you know, asked his, his engineering team, like, who's actually using this? And nobody on the team was using the product that they were building, even though they were, they were so thrilled about it. And yeah. so the one thing that they had left that was this little micro blogging tech site, and that was Twitter. And so they actually went back and returned a bunch of money regarding that to their investors regarding the micro blogging site or the, the, mic, um, the video blogging site to ultimately pivot to Twitter and then the rest is history. But you know, there, there's, a, there's an example of a really smart entrepreneur had had previous you know, B2C experience and ultimately like, you know, it's, it's so, so, so hard to know 
what what's going right. to what, what's going to grab the consumer and what's not. And and you would so you're you're pointing to the issue of you know what's going to win because it tends to be a zero sum game or a very few win right in B two C number one and number two it, uh, I also know that uh, we know that it just takes a lot usually takes a lot more money than anybody to plans to or expects or would imagine right to break just try to break um, in a B two C world. Yeah, I mean, there's an enormous amount of marketing and public relation dollars that have to be dedicated to building a B2C brand. Whereas if you're yeah. building a B2B brand, you, the, the, the amount of investment and, and, you know, you're typically, it's a one-to-one -one sale and you know your margins, you know, what to, you know the expectation and you can see a real clear path to profitability by doing that. Right. And you know, if you've got real traction or not, people are they buying the product, they're spending money on it and they're using it and you can tell if they're using it. So. Yeah. So I appreciate you breaking that down. Um, and I think, you know, Steve, uh, this has been a, a great hour and 15 minutes or so. I, I, this is, this was even, even, you know, I knew it was going to be great. I really did, but this was even better than I expected. And I loved how we just stayed focused on this topic. And that's why I got to book you again in a few months for the backstory because your your story, your your rise in entrepreneurship. I, I read through uh, your bio again, and I kind of know it, but I, I shudder when I read some elements of your story. You know, you've, you've had these some epic moments, uh, some big setbacks, and some big gains. And you know, you talked about you know you know being winning big and losing big and i just can't wait to share that but we got to do that another time we can really uh tell that story if you don't mind and um and uh is there any uh thing you'd like to um you kind of leave leave me with as any kind of closing thoughts um on this uh interview anything yeah come to mind? I, just um you know given the current environment with covid and lockdowns and um the difficult you know time that entrepreneurs face um, you know, my personal experience was I lived through the dot-com crash, had to lay off like in my entire team, um, get fired, a few months later, start a new company, then, you know, 9-11 hits, and, you know, it's, it's about the perseverance. And so the message for the entrepreneurs who are watching this is that there are lots of really, mine was just one small example, but there are lots of really great companies that are built in these really trying times because these are the entrepreneurs right now that demonstrate that, that perseverance and commitment that we were talking about earlier. So don't give up, keep going, and you know the future is yours. Well, Steve, one thing I want to say now, because that was a great uh, parting uh, message. I, one thing I want to say about you is that, um, you know, I know a lot of I know a lot of uh, angel investors, a um, hundred or more and just personally in different ways. And and I work, as you know, with so many founders at the Tampa Bay Wave. We've, we've serviced nearly 300 companies to date. And and at any given time, there's a proverbial hundred founders uh, that I know and work with that are already out there. And then, of course, at my with my with my classroom, there's there's more there by way of students. But of all the investors I work with, Steve, man, I got to tell you this. Um, you know, you're the you're you're going to me on a very short list of an investor I would want to have in my company, and I mean that. And I think I've told you this before, but I just want to say it publicly here, um, just because of your disposition, your patience, um, your insight, because you've been through really tough struggles, you've had it all happen to you. I mean, all the things that a founder would want, right? That's a lot of investors don't have that experience background. They just have, they have extra money, right? And they don't understand a lot of the things that, that are going to happen. And, and to be able to, I mean, heck, you're the kind of investor I think would put your, put your arm around, around a founder when they needed it, right? As long, again, as long as they were doing the things they needed to be doing, you'd be that guy. And, uh, and then on top of that, you have some of the most amazing connections <laughs> of anybody I know. So uh, I just, want to say that man it's an it's an honor to know you and um and i just i just love the fact that you're in this game and that you're going to come back in the game see the other thing that happens a lot of you guys like good guys like you they you know have these exits and this great success you've had and they sail off into the sunset and you've done some of that but you came back yeah. <laughs> you, you literally have sailed into the sunset i know those are another story there but you came back and then you're going to launch this whole this whole v mcdonald ventures man and and, and maybe bring to the Florida area or the Southeast area, whatever, kind of that kind of compassionate, uh, you know, investor uh, mode that that frankly, I think there's a handful of folks in the Valley and other way that, that have it. 
And I feel like you're importing some of that good stuff into into our community. I really feel I really I really mean that. Well, hopefully, hopefully time will yeah. tell. Yeah. Time, no, time won't tell. I already already know the answer to that. So thank you, Steve, for uh, being on this uh, episode. And um, and, uh, you know, we'll, as usual, we'll be in touch and um, I'm we're recording. I'll be posting this shortly and I'll keep you in the loop. Um, but thank you so much for being with me. OK, thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. OK, take care. Yes. All right. Be thanks. good out there. All right. <laughs> thanks.